Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's guest is Alberto Viotto. Alberto is a PhD and a Cuban-born psychologist and author who studied the shamanic healing practices of the Amazon and Inca shamans for 25 years. He's a founder of the Four Winds Society, and he has a two-year-long program in energy medicine and leads Ayahuasca Journeys to Peru. I've actually taken one of Alberto's classes with the Four Wind Society, which was really intense and quite useful. And it's my pleasure to have him on the show today. Alberto, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Good to be with you. And just a correction, I don't lead Ayahuasca Journeys to Peru. We used to do that. And um, we still go to Peru to the Andes and the Amazon and work with the shamans. Ah. But, uh, ah. but we, don't, we don't promote that aspect of our work. All right. But it's good to be with you, and I understand we're going to talk about uh, the brain, spirit, the mind, and um, everything in between. That sounds like exactly what I was hoping we'd talk about, Alberto. You're actually a medical anthropologist and a psychologist, not just a shaman, right? Well, you know, I started out in psychology, and the problem with psychology in the West is that it, it's, it's really... It's centered on two parts of the body, your mouth and your anus. <laughs> so it's, it's, you have either oral fixations or anal fix, fixations. And, and this theme, it's, it's, it's not got a very good cast of characters. It wouldn't play well in Hollywood because you've got mommy issues and daddy issues and infancy issues. So it's, you're really limited to the scope of, of your pathology. And, the, um, you know, like Woody Allen says, the secret to being stable mentally is to turn your pathology into shtick. <laughs> so, the, uh, so Western psychology really collapsed the human being into a very narrow band between your mouth and your, uh, the other end of your elementary canal. Whereas in traditional societies, the psyche was expansive as the universe. The, the realms of the archetypes of the gods of old were realms that one could traverse. You weren't stuck in mommy-daddy issues your entire life. You learn how to embrace the mother. Mother Earth is your great mother. And the heavens, Father Sky is your father. So you were able to release your parents. What about the age of 13? You put them in the fire so they could become your friends and, and, uh, and instead of turning them into dysfunctional parents. So I broke out of psychology and actually got a grant to go to the Amazon by a, from a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> they wanted a very famous Swiss pharmaceutical company wanted to f to uh, discover the next blockbuster cancer or heart disease drug, and I had done work in the Amazon and. Mm -hmm. Before and there were a lot of terrorist, a lot of terrorism happening in that part of the world in Peru, thirty years ago. And I was one of the few foolhardy anthropologists to go into the Amazon, and they funded my research. They wanted a blockbuster drug for heart disease, cancer, and mm -hmm. and six months later, I came back from extensive travel in tributaries of the Amazon in villages that had really had not ever seen a white man. In fact, the kids would come running up to me and rub my skin to see if the dirt, the white, would rub <laughs> off. And, uh, and I came back empty-handed and I, because what I said to these pharmaceutical company was, hey, people that I visited did not have heart disease. They did not have cancer. These are the illnesses of the West. They died, but from other from other conditions, and, and they thought I was holding out on them. And they said, look, you can become very, very wealthy and help a lot of people. And I said, look, I, I, didn't, I didn't find the plant you were looking for because these diseases do not exist outside of Europe and America at that time. When you take Americans or Westerners down for a healing journey with the native shamans, Today, are they finding the right medicine plants to treat those conditions? Have things changed? Well, you know, the, the shamans basically have three kinds of medicine. The first is the medicine for what hurts you. So if you have a headache, they have the aspirin tray. 
And you treat that. You've got a headache or you're bleeding and you've got to stop the bleeding. The second kind of plants that they work with are plants that turn on the body's innate healing systems. So they don't attack a cancer. They don't treat the heart. They, they switch back on the body self-repair mechanisms. And that means at the cellular level, they switch, all, they switch back on all of the antioxidant uh, systems that are built innately into the cell, but that switch off after about the age of 40, which is why we call these illnesses the illnesses of old age, because nature, in effect, programmed us for reproduction, not for longevity. So biology programmed us to have babies, not to live long lives because that's, that's not economically practical for the species. Now, I'm, I'm not interested in having any more kids, but I am interested in living a long and healthy life and having my health span equal my lifespan. So th- what these plants do is they turn off systems that switch off at around the age of 40 like your human growth hormone, like your production of glutathione, of superoxide dismutase. They switch on the system and they turn on, they switch on the longevity genes. They reset the death clock. The telomerase. Yeah, inside the cells. Absolutely. So this is the second category. Turn on your body's innate healing systems. And the third category of plants were the plants that repair the brain. Because the brain is the command and control center, and and if that's screwed up, you know, if your motherboard is screwed up, forget about accessing any data. You're going to be getting uh, error messages, and uh, and that's what happens when DNA is goes unregulated by consciousness. Is that it starts printing the error messages, which are the aberrant proteins that are the cancers and create heart disease. Now, you don't sound like what most listeners to our show would imagine a shaman would sound like, in, in that you just talked about the same biohacking chemicals like glutathione that I work with, yet you're taking this from the perspective of someone who's looking at the energy and the consciousness aspect and how it affects chemicals and genes. Have you done like science-based kind of data thinking about this to measure whether there are yeah. differences? Yeah. Yeah, we have actually, we have. And the reason that I'm not talking feathers and rattles <laughs> is because that's just part of what the shamans do. Yeah. They use that to get into certain states of consciousness that we can't get into anymore in the West. These are the shamanic states of ecstasy. We can't access those anymore because our brains are broken. They've been broken by the toxins in our food, the poisons in the water, the chemicals that we're exposed to that damage the hippocampus in the brain, which is the area responsible for learning. And the in, when that area in the brain is damaged, we're living in a constant state of fight or flight, of fear-based, of scarcity behavior, of getting your slice of the pie. And the... Um, and when you live in fight or flight, the brain secretes two hormone, two um, uh, very, very toxic substances, and that are actually steroid hormones, which are cortisol and adrenaline. So you're always pumped up, always hyped up, and the um, and that's and that prevents us from accessing the ecstatic, blissful states where we can actually be creative, where we can dream the future into being differently, where we can dream our health differently into being. And what it does, when you see, when you have this cortisol cocktail in your brain with stress hormones, is that this pathway for fight or flight is actually called, by from a standpoint of medicine, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. When this HPA axis is turned on, it's dedicated to the fear hormones. The pituitary is only manufacturing and triggering the stress hormones. And it keeps the pituitary from running the alchemical laboratory because that's the alchemical lab. Because the pituitary is able to take things like serotonin or melatonin even, what we use to go to sleep, uh, into DMT. 
which is dimethyltryptamine, which is the most powerful psychoactive substance in the planet, which is what triggers these, the chemical component of these visionary ecstatic states. And, um, and that's one of the things that pituitary is excellent at doing when it's not stressed out, when it doesn't have a gun to its head. So, so Alberto, you're saying the pituitary gland can take melatonin and turn it into DMT at will? It not at not at will. It does so between four and five o'clock in the morning, when it when it's the brain is in these very very calm states of consciousness, and when you're de-stressed. Because the reason these psychedelics that I see, you know, I'm really into the brain science because the shamans were the very first brain scientists. Yes, the first biohackers. Absolutely. They knew how to create uh, 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 the, they knew the blend for ayahuasca. You know, how do you blend these two plants to get it to go through the gut wall? Um, and they need, knew how to prepare curare, which is this incredible neurotoxin that is, we, is the basis of modern um, anesthetics. So the, um, the reason these psychoactive plants work is because we have receptor sites for them in the brain. And why would nature give us receptor sites for these plants out there in the wild? The reason we have them is because we produce them naturally. We produce morphine, the endorphins naturally. We produce DMT. We produce psilocybin. Psilocybin is magic mushrooms. Well, psilocybin is a methylated dopamine. And dopamine is the common neurotransmitter, feel-good neurotransmitter. And methylation is what the pituitary does. It methylates it. This is the alchemical lab. This is the and you and the way to do your biohacking is when you're in these states of lucid consciousness, where consciousness itself can modify your genetic expression. It's amazing what methylating common neurotransmitters will do. There's some other new things coming out around that that are amazingly effective for enhancing consciousness. Absolutely, yeah. So this is, you know, this is the juicy thing for me about being in the jungle is because I, I have a little bit of background in brain science, so I could, I could get what these guys were doing. They weren't, they weren't treating, you know, uh, the stomach upset. They were switching on the brain so that the nervous system could, could upgrade the quality of the information in the entire operating system. So you could start running software that nobody's ever run before. <clears throat> so n now, one of the things that surprised me about you, Alberto, is you've got a very strong spiritual side of what you do. But when I went to your healing academy at the Four Winds, I was surprised that you spent so much time talking about neurotransmitters and brain chemistry and, and things like that, in that it seems like at least half of your perspective on how to upgrade the human experience or just increase people's consciousness is biochemically based and maybe half is energetically based. Am I reading that right? Like, How do you draw the line between those two or how do you integrate them? Well, you know, we're spirit embodied. We're spirits in a body. And the reason that we be, we came here to this world and to this earth from uh, the spirit world is so we could experience chocolate. And, you know, chocolate is, ex <laughs> among other things, <laughs> good coffee, chocolate, the senses, you know, and the... Uh, so when spirit becomes embodied, suddenly spirit is being modulated by and regulated by... Uh, by electrical activity, hormonal activity, and the um, and the problem is that the you have to get these systems, the electrical and hormonal systems, into balance so spirit can adequately sit in this protein wrap that we are, and the um, and so that in the shamanic traditions we work with the chakras, with the energy centers in the body. And people ask me, well, aren't chakras Hindu? I mean, do shamans have chakras? And I say to them, well, you know, aren't kidneys European? Do Africans have kidneys? <laughs> you know, if it's part of your luminous anatomy, it's, it's universal. And the way that the chakras are actually disturbances in the field, in the energy field of the body, 
that are caused, created when the endocrine system meets the nervous system. Nerve bundles coincide with endocrine glands, and you know what endocrine glands produce? It's, it's hormones. Yep. And if you've had a teenager, or if you remember being a teenager, you know what hormones are like. <laughs> so the, uh, this is where these two communication systems in the body meet. This disturbance in the field is the chakra. So the shaman will work through the chakras to download or upload information into the system, into the nervous system, which runs electrically at the speed of light, and the hormone system, which is an analog system. The nervous system is digital, Pew, speed of light. Hormone system is chemical, it primarily transmits feelings. And what you have happening today is that the amount of information in our thoughts operate at the speed of light, the nervous system, but our feelings operate at, you know, at the, at, on snail mail. They're going on the hormone system, which is really slow, chemical carriers. And there's this great disparity, this junction between what we feel and what we think. That today, to the point that it's so hard to bridge that gap. And when you have this incredible schism between what you feel and what you think, you cannot be spirit embodied. You, you're, you're, you're living in a war zone. So that's why we focus our attention more now into how do you, how do you turn your brain on? How do you create health so that disease goes away? We're not just teaching people how to heal disease. We're teaching them how to create health. How do you do that by upgrading the quality of the wisdom in the system of the information? Not treating cancer or treating heart disease or treating symptoms. Upgrade the information level. Make the system smarter. And the body attains states of health that are extraordinary. One of the more interesting studies I've come across in the last year talked about how people cannot get smarter unless they believe that they can get smarter. Once they're taught you're capable of it, they are capable of it. But without that, the intelligence is limited. How does that fit in with your experience of working with people? <laughs> well, you know the story about the UPS guy. Remember that story? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> well, there was this ashram. I don't know if this really happened or not, but I love the story. There was this ashram. People practice meditation, and they got UPS packages every day or every other day. And right in the front office, there was a photograph of the guru in meditation. And one day, they put the face, the image of the face of the UPS guy, on the painting of the guru. And when the UPS guy comes, they start bowing to him, say, oh, you're here, you're back, thank you so much, come and come be with us sometime. And the guy's bewildered, leaves, comes back two days later, they're bowing to him again, and he sees his photograph up on the... In the face of the Maharishi. So they, we've been waiting for you. They welcome him in. He comes into their meditation and begins to speak. And this wisdom starts flowing through him. I mean, this exquisite wisdom. And, the, uh, and he said, you know, before meeting you guys, I was just the UPS guy. I didn't know that, that that spirit that I was the one you were waiting for. And a few days later, he discovers that everyone is the one that they've been waiting for because... There's a new UPS guy with a new face up on the, uh, <laughs> on the wall. So, yes, the minute you believe you can do it, then it becomes possible to do it. But it's not a given. I worked with, uh, with Olympic teams, and you had to get the athlete first to believe that they could do it. And then they had to train as if they had already done it. Why is it, it why is it that way? Like why do you have to train as if you've already done it? And how should people who listen to this, a lot of them are driving in cars right now, how can they take that perspective into whatever they're doing? Well that's the shamanic perspective, which is that you envision that it's already done. It's already happened. What you're trying to create in your life has already been created. And it's just a simply a matter of it manifesting, of it waiting for you around the corner. Now, if that sounds weird to people listening, it's not that particularly unusual. Look at Napoleon Hill's work, same mm -hmm. exact thing. You write it down as if it's been done. Any yep. of the people, the secret, things like that. 
if you're going to set an intention, the rule is not, I'm going to do it some point in the future, maybe whenever, it's that I already did it, and that seems yeah. to make it happen. Totally. What the shamans and the shamans are the medicine men and women. You know, we never defined who the shamans were. But the, they are the wisdom keepers of the Americas, the ancient wisdom keepers of the Americas. They were the first scientists. They were the first astronomers. They were also the healers, but that was not their main. That's what they did for a living. What they did for themselves was to commune with the wisdom of the universe and to help to dream the world into being. And they discovered you couldn't only dream a nicer car or a better looking spouse than you thought you deserved. You couldn't just dream the individual thing into being. You could, but it would backfire. You had to dream the whole thing into being, the whole universe, the whole world, peace on earth, water clean, air breathable, and then the better, the nicer car and the spouse would appear and everything else would come. But if you try to do it, you know, reductionistic one thing at a time, it wouldn't work. Because you would then feed in your personal dream and not the great dream of humanity. I very much agree with what you're saying. At the same time, I think a lot of listeners have a hard time drawing the line, we have a Western perspective that you know, medicine man or shaman is someone who's irrational or illogical. And some of what you said there, dream the world into being. Those words, when I run them through like my rational cognitive filter in my head, like, I, I don't get it. That's For people who are skeptical, what do you say? I'm not a skeptic, by the way, but what no, do you I, say I, to the skeptics? Well, the reason you don't get it is because your brain is broken. No, not yours, <laughs> I know. But every, you know, I know that everybody who's driving out there or listening to this says, "Hey, I'm together." It's the other guy that's all screwed yeah. up. And the, uh, but the truth is that 99 percent of us have brains that have been that are broken. And I'll give, and that's why we cannot hold the idea or entertain the idea that we dream truly our reality. And it manifests, it comes true. And that the higher you dream it into being, the higher the order of magnitude, the more effective that it cas cascades down to the day-to-day -day and the immediate. But the reason our brains have been broken is because of our diet. Can yes. I take through that tour quickly? Yes, please do. <laughs> okay, so around 10,000 years ago, there was a revolution in the agricultural revolution. We stopped being hunter-gatherers, Paleolithic, and we have the agricultural revolution where we discover a new kind of food, which are grains. Now, the human genome, DNA, takes about forty to 50,000 years to adapt to a new food. But we discovered this new food and began producing it in quantity, and we settled. We're no longer following the game, going to the water holes, hunter-gatherers. We started settling. And then around 6,000 years ago, agriculture really spread. Cities began to develop. And you find that the grains are widespread. Population increases and religion appears. Before that, our primary diet was fats and proteins. Now, our diet becomes carbs, which are sugars. And you have the religions that say, and give us this day our daily fats and proteins, right? <laughs> Give, give us this day our daily bread. And you have two classes of people that appear. You have the class of masters and slaves. The slaves were the pyramid builders who religion promised them a reward in the next life. And the masters were, the, and the slaves were fed the high sugar rich carbs. The slaves were the pyramid builders and the warriors, the soldiers, fed the sugars feeds this, that region in the brain that lives in fear and that in fight or flight and in scarcity. Now, the masters continued eating the ancient diet. If you look at what the Egyptian priest ate, if you look at what the Inca kings, they had fish run up to Machu Picchu, to the mountains from the, from the sea, 400 miles away by runners. They continued to feed on the high pro good quality protein 
and good good quality fats, primarily um, non animal fats. So the uh, so they have full access to their brain. They understood that whatever you said your intention to, you could bring about. Now today we don't believe that because we're we're living in a very disempowered world, and um, and there are great corporate interests that are that want to keep us so, in that slave mentality. And what you and I are here to do, and all of you who are listening to this show, is to say, hey. You know, we're masters of our own destiny. We can dream it into being. You're not your genetics. You're not your genes. You are your dreams. Your genes only account for 5 to 10% of your health. The rest is your lifestyle and your communion with nature and the beauty that you bring to life. So the first step for the shaman was to repair the brain. And I think for us as well, it's an important step. And we can a little bit later go into what the plant substances are that repair the brain. I think that you've definitely got our listeners interested in what those are. Before we get there, though, you mentioned you know, this high-fat, high-protein diet. When I look at what the average CEO eats, at least the guys that I talk to before I start working with them as clients, they eat garbage they're not eating these kinds of foods. So if in the old days, the Egyptian pharaohs or Incan kings ate a diet for a fully functioning mind and everyone else didn't, when you fast forward to today, the vast majority of leaders of industry don't have brains that are functioning. At least they don't eat like they do. Mm -hmm. uh, so then who are the people eating that way, pulling the strings? Or did we just forget this <laughs> knowledge and now we're walking around like a bunch of robots? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the uh, one of the foods that repairs this is um, is DHA, and we're going to get to yeah. DHA, the omega threes, in a little while. I know you're very familiar with them. Do share. Yeah, but keep but talking. The, yeah. <laughs> but the uh, the reason that uh, these guys, the CEOs, they're still slaves to the system. You know, they're making a little bit more money than we are. And they're, they're, but they don't have any more free time. Their lives are screwed up. Their health is screwed up. Their relationships are screwed up. You walk in to consult with them and you see that their children hate them and that they can't stand their image and that they're, they're overweight and, they're, and they don't sleep well and they're losing their hair and they're, they got rashes on their skin and they're depressed. So the fact that they appear to be more successful doesn't mean that they're having more successful lives, but it begins with your diet, and then it goes on to your spiritual practice. Yeah. If you and, don't have adequate brain fuel, how are you going to use all of your brain? That was a big learning for me personally. Totally. Yeah. And if your brain fuel is only carbs, you know what the minimum daily requirement of carbs are? I would argue it's about 15 grams for long periods of time. It's actually zero, unless you're a marathon runner. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but, the, uh, but we have minimum daily requirements of proteins and fats. Now, the carbs are the grains. And we, we can work with the carbs. In fact, I include grains in my diet, but the, um, uh, which the, the strict Paleolithic people don't. But we have to remember that the diet is only half of it. We have to also recover the Paleolithic mindset, which is the shamanic mindset, which is the communion with all life and all of creation. And the relationship to the earth is one of stewardship and not a predatory one where it's ours for the taking. So the starts with the diet. <clears throat> and the diet that and the, the brain runs on on sugars, but it prefers the higher brain functions run on fats, particularly a fat called beta hydroxybutyrate, <laughs> which brain is octane makes that jet, right. <laughs> jet fuel for the brain. And the way you get that, if you want a little bit of that, you can't get it in a drive-through service station, but you can get some coconut oil or coconut butter, which is and uh, eat a spoonful of it. Imagine it's vanilla ice cream. Pure food for mitochondria 
and which so it's a it's a fat it's a medium chain triglyceride and it turns on the brain so if you got a difficult problem in your hands you got to feed the brain with the right fuel so alberto when we met i hadn't quite started shipping brain octane which is four percent of coconut oil that converts to bhb the fastest so wow. this, this is what I put a tablespoon of in my coffee in the morning, which is equal to 18 tablespoons of coconut oil in terms of BHP. Really? Yeah. Oh, I want to order some. I'll order just some. send you some. Uh, consider it done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So let me, let me take us to another area, <clears throat> which is not only that our brains have been damaged. You know, we have two brains in the body, and um, one of them is in our heads. And guess where the other one is? That would be the gut. The gut, right. I know the gut brain. So what's happened is that, you know, it's really fascinating because humans are a colony organism. So we are, if you look at a grain of rice or at a tapeworm, a grain of rice has 90,000 genes in its DNA. A tapeworm has 70,000 genes. A human has 24,000 genes. So we have far fewer genes than rice or tapeworms. Why is that? And that's because we have over 600 microorganisms that live in our gut. And we have hijacked their genetic machinery to have them produce vitamins and extract minerals. They're the workers. In fact, they outnumber us 10 to 1 so that 90% of our DNA belongs to them. Only 10% of our who we are is, is we. So if you ever wake up in the morning and say to yourself, I'm not feeling my, quite myself today, you're absolutely right because you're not. Because nine-tenths of you, of your DNA, belongs to the symbiotic creatures that are part of our colony. And what the Western diet and fluorinated and chlorinated water does and antibiotics is that they destroy the, the flora in the blood so that the so that the colony has been decimated and if the colony is decimated we can't extract foods and not only that we start getting a problem known as leaky gut so that you have because the lining in the gut if you were to spread it out it would be the size of a tennis court and it's only one uh, cell thick and these cells have very tight junctions they don't want to allow anything through that has been processed by the flora and what happens when you have grain that contain gluten is that the gluten will wedge itself between these tight junctions through a protein called somulin that allows the gluten to get into the bloodstream and the immune system recognizes that gluten as a pathogenic bacteria and attacks it. And you have this huge immune reaction happening. So all your life force is going into this immune response to fight off that piece of bread that you had this morning. <laughs> yeah, it sucks you. Totally. So, the, uh, so we have to repair the brain, but we start with repairing the gut with the right probiotics. And we can do that. Now, when you say the right probiotics, I, I've spent at least fifty or sixty thousand dollars on probiotics over the past while. I took antibiotics for fifteen years, about once a month for chronic sinusitis and all. And what are the right probiotics in your experience? Well, you know, if you go to uh, your local pharmacy, you buy strains of probiotic, twelve billion per. Yeah. So. You're, you're buying soldiers that are going to recolonize this territory that you lost. But these are not necessarily smart soldiers. You no. it better, better to have, you know, 10 special forces guys than 10 million, you know, chaotic, crazy guys with spears. <laughs> so you got to get the smart probiotics and the high quality probiotics. Now, there's a company that, that manufactures what I think are the best probiotics. And what they did is that they collected the probiotics from the soil from the, um, of the blue zones around the world. 
which were the, the high longevity regions around the world. And then they train them. They make them smart bugs. So, but regardless of whether you use, and I can give you the name of this company, but the... Sure, um, we'll put it in the show notes. Great. Um, but get a probiotic that you refrigerate. It needs to be refrigerated. Be sure it comes from a good source. And most of the time we're getting dumb bugs, which is why this really... Uh, this company also makes a toothpaste, for example. You need the probiotics in your mouth because that's what keeps your teeth healthy. And you need them in your sinuses and in your lungs. And uh, they, we also need the, the, the other place where your flora lives is in our skin. And we take a shower with chlorinated water, we kill all the good bugs in our skin. And we end up only with the bad ones. And they keep us from getting skin diseases and rashes and... So we need to repopulate the, the, you know, we've worked in the West, we're focused on chemicals, which are dead. And the shamans focus on the living, what are the living ingredients? So the probiotics in your skin, in your mouth, in your GI tract, they're enlisting the help of nature to maintain your health optimally. I, I laughed when you said probiotics from soil because... I've done a lot of research on what different strains that you buy in most common uh, pharmacies and whatnot, what they do. And a lot of them form histamine or they form nitrosamines in the gut. They actually make you weaker. Totally. Yeah. And soil based trapped. organisms, I recommend. Yeah. So you got to be careful what bugs you buy. Yeah. I mean, you're, bu you're buying life forms. So some people spend more money buying buying fertilizer for their yards than they do buying fertilizing bugs for their gut so, it's it's <clears throat> astounding to me what people spend on taking care of their dog that they won't spend on taking care of themselves yeah why is that well i don't know but i took my dog to the vet the other day and <laughs> I, had, I had to go to the doctor myself and the first thing the doctor asked me is what medications are you on and uh, I took my dog to the vet, and the first thing the vet asked, what do you feed this dog? So I'm going to start going to the vet from now on, because it's all with the food, you know? It starts with the food. My dog doesn't really go to the vet, but my dog also eats a diet high in MCT oil, raw meat, mm -hmm. and a few vegetables, and funny what that does. It's incredible. Yeah. It's healthy. You know how many cancers pets get? Now, if you were to slip it in a tablet of resveratrol into the dog food, it's extraordinary. Yes. It's the missing ingredient. Resveratrol is, um, switches on all of the longevity genes in humans and in animals. So that's one of these, um, one of these great there's, hacking tools. There's been a lot of controversy about resveratrol. Some of the early studies were faked. There's concerns about estrogen activity. Despite all that, in your experience, you recommend res resveratrol? I do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, terostilbene and resveratrol. Yeah, by the way, for people listening, terostilbene is a strange spelling. We'll put that in the show notes. That's what I take. It's two transresveratrols stuck together. Tell us about it. So, I mean, I, I don't, I want to make sure that we give you the most time to share your knowledge, but for people concerned about the resveratrol problem, there was some scientific fraud, but resveratrol itself as an antioxidant and as something that replicates the effects of a low calorie diet without the negative brain impact of a low calorie diet, it's pretty magic. So I take pterostilbene and I take upgraded aging, which also mimics caloric restriction. So that combination can increase mitochondrial function and hopefully slow the aging process. Mm -hmm. How does reverse, that map with what you know? Reverse the aging process. Yeah. Well, we consider aging is not natural. You know, the brain fog and mm -hmm. God, it's harder to get out of bed every morning. And uh, um, no, I think that you can keep your clarity, your sexuality, your sense of humor, your vitality until the day you drop dead. <laughs> but it, unfortunately, in the West, we all have to fit within the bell curve. And the bell curve, it's already picked a death sentence for you. It says that 32% of us will die of heart disease and 29% of cancer. And only one out of 100 will die in the arms of his or her beloved at the age of 120 after great sex. And that this would be the best way to die that I can think of. 
that'll be the outliers, you know, and that's what we, <laughs> but when you look at the shamanic traditions, this is how people live. They die of old age. They died of accidents and some parasites, but we know how to treat those today. So we have the opportunity to really live smartly, but that means we have to have smart bugs, smart bra- smart bugs in our bellies, smart uh, brains, and okay. the brain foods that do that. So far, you've mentioned DHA, you've mentioned soil-based organisms, and you're going to give me a link. We'll put it all on there. I, I'm not sure there's so many different SBOs now. And then you just mentioned transverse ferritrol or pterostilbene. Mm-hmm. What are the other things that fix the brain that you referenced earlier? Well, I'll tell you a couple. Uh, when I was in the in the jungle in the Amazon as a medical anthropologist and eventually as a student of the shamans, I was going through my training, which included fasting, and, and fasting is extraordinary. Yes. You fast one day a week. Um, that... Um, and the shamans would say to me, well, you've got to eat the bark of that root, of that tree and those roots over there. And I go, why? They, they say, because it's always been done that way. And that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted the science behind it. But, you know, science belongs to us in the West, not to. So I went ahead and ate it. It tasted like crap. <laughs> it was awful. You guys boil it. I chew it. And... Then we took it to the laboratory 20 years later, and, uh, and we found that what they were doing is that they were repairing the brain. They were turning on the longevity genes, the sirtuin genes, and there are a few substances that do that. Um, first, omega-3s, which we used to get from fish. And, um, and, because, and they're essential fatty acids because the body does not produce them. Um, that's why they're called essential and today we can't get it from fish anymore because all of our fish is farm raised and they're fed corn yeah. and you cannot make DHA from corn DHA breast milk is 40% DHA because the brain needs it yeah. and if you're not if you don't know somebody who's lactating you've got to mm-hmm. supplement because you need the DHA to repair the regions in the brain where learning happens. Because if you're not learning, you're repeating what you already learn. You're repeating the same job, the same relationship, the same arguments with your spouse, the same attitudes, been there, done that. The, uh, you stagnate. And what, you know what happens when you do that is you become a grouchy, crabby old person. <laughs> My wife and I were having dinner the other night at a restaurant, and there was this couple sitting about six tables away, not too many people there, and you could tell they'd been together for a hundred years, <laughs> and the uh, and they hated each other. <laughs> they weren't talking to each other, and we were kind of watching them, and the uh, finally after about twenty minutes, she says to her, "Pass the salt," and. You know, I, you can read between the lines, and what he's saying is, pass us all, bitch, you ruined my- <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens when you don't repair your brain. You become a grouchy old guy whose world has collapsed, or a gold woman that's bitter and angry. But if you repair it, you keep learning all your life. Hey, Alberto, I, I have to tell you that one of the highlights of the entire podcast uh, history is that you just said, pass the salt, bitch, on the show. <laughs> I would not ever have predicted you'd say that. What a great story. <laughs> <laughs> Should I watch my language? I'm sorry. You can no, no. Yeah. Just, I, I wouldn't have predicted that yeah. would ever come from you, but what a perfect story. So uh, it yeah. just made me laugh. <laughs> so DHA, DHA, we're, we're on the brain foods. DHA is essential. Yeah. Curcumin, which is from turmeric. Yes. Curcumin, a gram a day. DHA, let's go back to DHA and EPA, which are the omega 3s. You should be doing about three grams of omega 3 a day. And What's your most- favorite source? I, I recommend krill on the Bulletproof diet. Do you like krill or do you like salmon or do you like uh, sardines or some other kind of fish oil? I love salmons and sardines, but I like my DHA from, uh, from algae. Okay, got it. The, the so, which is, stuff. yeah, the the but it, you know, there as long as you have a good supplier, they're all equally good. 
I try to get the phosphorylated DHA because then your body doesn't have to phosphorylate it to put it in the brain. Do you, is it worth the extra money for that in your experience? It's worth it. It is? Okay. Sure. You're, you're saving energy for this to the system. Okay. And, um, so turmeric in America, if you live to be 85 years old, the odds of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's are one out of two. 50% of Americans who live to be 85 will have diagnosable Alzheimer's, which means that it began 20 years before. <clears throat> if you yep. look at the statistics in India, where they eat a lot of curcumin and turmeric, it's only 15%. And if you go to some Native American populations, it's only 5%. Or it's non-existent if you go to the Amazon. So the curcumin is essential because it switches on both mitochondrial biogenesis, a production of new mitochondria, as well as the sirtuin genes, and it's an amazing anti-inflammatory, nature's best anti-inflammatory. That is exactly in, in line with with my understanding, people should always be eating food cooked with it, or they should be taking that as a supplement. Absolutely, and then eat 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 colorful. Eat for the rainbow. Eat go for the colors in food. The uh, avoid anything white. In fact, if you want to really stay healthy, avoid anything that has a label. But anything that's <laughs> white, don't eat it. <laughs> now, and if you can't pronounce what's in it, don't buy it. Now I, I eat at least 10 servings of vegetables a day. I, I recommend that on the Bulletproof diet. But I found when I went down to a zero carb diet for three months, I'm talking one serving of green vegetables a day, I developed leaky gut and got new food allergies, which is why yeah. I, I try to keep about 15 grams or more occasionally of, of carbs to allow mucus formation. Yeah, but don't, don't get your carbs from, uh, from grains. Okay, now I also say if you're gonna eat carbs to refuel glycogen once a week, Sweet potatoes are first, but white rice is the lowest toxin non-sweet potato thing that I could find that would provide starch. Yeah. What's your take on white rice? Yeah, I like, I like rice. You know, I, if you look at the great religions in the world and the traditions in the world, you see that in Europe, the Europeans are people of the wheat. And the religions there are around the wheat. And in Christianity, you have the wheat, the wafer, that becomes mm -hmm. the body of Christ. And, and Demeter was the goddess of the Greeks. That was the goddess of the, of the wheat. And in Asia, it's the rice. The people of the rice. And the Americas is the corn. The Hopi traditions around corn. Corn is seen as the mother. <clears throat> so the, um, I like rice. I think that the real critter here is gluten. Yeah, it, you, you can't have a fully functioning brain and eat gluten on a regular basis. I, I don't believe it's possible. I don't either. And in fact, if you want to have a fully functioning shamanic brain where you develop all kinds of what we would call extraordinary abilities mm -hmm. where you're able to see things that other people can't. And now this is, there was a wonderful book that was, published uh, about 40 years ago called Executive ESP, wow. among top Fortune 500 companies. And, the, um, and they found that the, the executives that had the highest ESP scores, which is the ability to see things that other people can't see, actually more than doubled their personal net worth and their company's net worth in the same period of time where the executives with the lowest ESP scores actually lost money for their companies. And, and this book explains how they determined what an ESP score is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool. you, you standardize ESP tests. I'll show you the book. Oh, awesome. Uh, I'm going to have to read this. We may find that there's a shortage of this book used on Amazon after the show goes public. <laughs> it's, you got to go, uh, you got to get it. Uh, friends of mine actually wrote it. You've got to get it. Online, can you see it? Yeah, it's a brilliant book, and the uh, and the actually were um, it was co-authored by um, Sheila Ostrander and Lynn Schroeder, which act which wrote the book Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, what we were calling psychic phenomena, which we think, you know, that voodoo priests and shamans and psychics and mediums have, they're actually natural abilities of every human.
but we find them in such a small number of the population that we consider them super normal or super ordinary. But they are ordinary, they're natural, they're normal. And when you repair the brain, repair the gut, feed the brain with the high mitochondrial foods and trigger the mitochondrial repair, these abilities begin to appear on their own. You don't need to be a yogi or chant om, though it helps. You just have to do the basics. And then the, the human potential begins to reveal itself to you. Uh, that is so well said. And it's it's been my own experience. You just end up gaining intuition and creativity in a way that you didn't before when you remove the self-limiting foods and you add in the things that increase brain power. Precisely. And you know, we're only two or three days away from feeling well. Yeah. Take for granted the fact that, well, I'm just getting older or I haven't exercised or it's natural. No, we take for granted the fact that we're waking up every morning not feeling good. And it only takes two or three days of getting, first of all, getting the dairy out of your diet, getting the gluten out of your diet, getting the inflammatory so sugars out of your diet, and getting the, getting the, 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 the junk out of your diet. And within three to four days, you feel better. In fact, we, we have a program we call Growing a New Body, where in seven days, we trigger the growth of a new, of a new body that's healed, that's healthy. <clears throat> uh, I will include links to that. That sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. My own experience is you really do feel massive reductions in inflammation. When you start eating, quote, a clean diet, you get rid of all the various sources of things that slow you down. All of a sudden, you wake up and... You have and a you're, level of mental abilities you didn't. And you're sleeping well, and your brain fog clears, and you laugh again. <laughs> you know, it's important. You, you laugh for no reason sometimes. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you another question. We're coming close to the end of the show. Do you drink coffee? I love coffee. So does coffee, in your experience increase your ability to do some of the the more uh, high, high functioning mental states that you work with as a shaman or is it more just like an energizer kind of thing okay let's go back to the brain and the um there's a uh, you know in, in western science we work we look at, at pathways neural pathways chemical pathways because when you find a pathway that a, that a, um, a chemical f works on, you can patent that and you've got a pharmaceutical remedy you can make a lot of money with. And um, whereas, so we look at single, um, as, at single active chemicals. So the, um, um, whereas the shaman works with the entire plant. Now you can't pl patent comfrey or oregano. <laughs> But if you take an extract from it, you find the active ingredient, you can. So we look at pathways, and the shaman instead looks at the whole plant, looks at networks, which are bunches of pathways. And then you want to look at systems, which are not bunches of networks. But if you go back to the pathways, there's say coffee is the best stimulant for of a detox pathway called the NRF2 detox pathway. And what it does is that it switches on, and there are a number of products that do that, turmeric, uh, um, broccoli, all the cruciferous vegetables do that. Uh, they turn on the detox pathways inside the cell that shut down after about the age of 40. So they turn on the production of glutathione, of SOD, um, and within 30 days of taking these upregulators, you find that you return to your, your antioxidant production you had when you were 18 years old. Now, what does that is turmeric, cruciferous vegetables, coffee is one of the best ones to turn on this pathway. You begin to detoxify, switches on the longevity genes, but you can only have coffee and enjoy it, really, if your fight or flight is turned off. Because yeah. if you're living in a world that is dangerous 
and you need to be hyper alert and stimulated, then the coffee is going to be affecting negatively the, the, the adrenaline pathways. And when you're able to relax and de-stress by repairing the brain, repairing the gut, coffee is manna from heaven. Now, some people react to it and should not have it. But the, even if you have the decaffeinated coffee and it's a quality decaf because it's non-toxic, and you can talk about that, I'm sure, yeah. um, it still activates that same pathway. That's exactly the reason that I made a decaf upgraded coffee bean, even though uh, I believe it's better for people to have the fully caffeinated coffee sure. with all of its oils intact. There are benefits to the decaf mm -hmm. stuff uh, that I've seen in multiple studies. So I, I consider it a core part of what I do on a regular basis, but I just wanted to get the kind of shaman meditation perspective from you on it. And uh, we, we didn't line this up ahead of time or anything. I, yes. I ask a lot of the guests about this. Some say they like coffee, some say they don't. So, so you are you selling the intravenous, you know, the, the day long drip that you can take through the vein directly? Yeah, of yeah. intravenous espresso, <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> a shot to go. Huh? So, yeah, coffee is, is um, you know, everything in nature is, is, has its beauty. But there are certain plants that when you take them, the body interprets them as poisons and mounts this huge antioxidant response to them. They're not really poison. In fact, all of our spices yeah. are plants that we haven't fully adapted to. And the, the example is... Uh, when you have iceberg lettuce, iceberg lettuce doesn't taste like anything. You've got a whole bunch of olive oil and blue cheese on it for it to taste like something. But if you take arugula, arugula is delicious. It's got a little spice to it. And that's because we have completely adapted to iceberg lettuce, to the chemical defenses. But arugula we're still adapting to as a species. So it's got a little bite. All the spices are plants that we're still adapting to, but that are not toxic. But some of them, the body reads them as toxins, and when they're not, and mounts this huge antioxidant response to them, and it turns on the machinery that is creaked slowly to semi-death inside the cell, switches it back on again full force, starts producing new mitochondria, and starts regenerating. And this is what fasting does. Uh, curcumin, coffee triggers that same mechanism. So, um, and shamans learned a long time ago that if you wanted to heal an illness, you don't treat the illness. In fact, you look at the illness as the best effort that the body is making to heal itself. Not as the enemy, but the best that the body knows how to do to bring about healing. So you work with the illness and not against it. And you work not by treating the illness, but by turning on the self-healing systems inside the body. Yeah, that is a wonderful way of looking at it. And it's so much more holistic than I'm going to fix this one thing, not knowing what else will change around yeah. it. I mean, especially today where you look, at, uh, you look at Western medicine and you have doctors by geography. You know, the doctors who specialize in the head and some of them in the gut and some of them in the feet and the heart and the and the head docs, the neurologists, don't talk to the gut docs. And most of the head problems come from the gut. So doctors are specialized in organs and in diseases, and nobody specializes in the whole body. But if people want to learn more about this, they can visit our website at The Four Winds, where we have in the additional reading section at thefourwinds.com, T H E F O U R. W I N D S dot com. You actually read my mind, which I guess is a skill that you've trained. Uh, I was going to ask you, what's the URL that people should be going to? Is that the only URL you want to share? That's the. That's probably the best one. Okay. And uh, if you if you uh, friend me in Facebook or like me in Facebook, the uh, we have feed a lot of interesting material, and that's under the four winds uh, as well. Okay. The four winds, F O U R W I N D S. A lot of good shamanic insight with brain sprinkling of brain material. I mean, what I amazed me when I went to the Amazon is is I saw them prepare curare one time. Can I tell the story? We yes, have time. Please, yeah. 
so they're you know they're brewing this stuff in the and I'm and I get a whiff of it at a distance. It smells delicious. It smell like bread baking, and the um, and I start getting closer to it. They stop me and they say, "Don't go any closer." And I go, "Why? Because you'll die." <laughs> <laughs> so curare is prepared by mixing seven plants. It's a neurotoxin. They it's use like the, it. In- it's like the smell from Subway. When that yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not quite that bad, but the uh, but. Uh, they'll put it in blow darts and blow guns to, and the um, and it, you need to cook it 72 hours exactly, no longer, no shorter. Seven plants, and the uh, and if you smell the aroma, it kills you within 20 seconds. Wow! But when it's prepared, it's a very thick paste, and the shaman says, "Open your hand," and he puts a glob of it in my hand, and I ask him, "What's what is it?" He's a curare. I drop it. He says, no, 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 it can't hurt you. You could swallow it, and it'll go through your full digestive tract. It'll put it in your hand. But if it comes into contact with blood, that's when you're in trouble. So, And I ask him, how did you learn which seven plants to cook? And, and they couldn't have smelled it because they would have died. They wouldn't have been able to tell their children what to do or not to do. And the shamans say, well, the plants told us. The jungle told us how to do it. So these are people that still have an active dialogue with nature and with spirit and can learn directly from nature. They can learn directly from the wisdom of the universe. That's pretty profound. Alberto, every guest on the show gets asked the same question at the end of the show. What are the top three recommendations that you would make for someone who wants to perform better across all domains of their life? So your entire life's wisdom and work distilled into the three most important things for the average person. What are they? You know, I don't give advice. (laughs) (laughs) So the first one would be don't give advice to anybody that you're not doing yourself. (laughs) And the second one would be uh, laugh a lot. Because at the end, you know, it, it's all it's all funny. It's all very funny. It's all a good good joke. And uh, and the third is prepare to prepare to die, so that you're you're living your life complete in every moment, and you know that you have lived it to the best that you possibly could, and um, and that life continues beyond death. Thank you, Alberto. Awesome. Awesome points, and what a great interview. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on Bulletproof Radio today. We'll have links to your Facebook page, to the Four Winds website, and all the other things we talked about today in the show notes so people can find them. Uh, For people listening, I would encourage you to look at Alberto's work. He is a true brain hacker who's absolutely willing to look at biochemistry and then go straight up to meditation and see how the two come together. I've learned a lot from him. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and blessings, and blessings to everyone listening to us today. And don't forget to send me that product. I want to try it out. Uh, You'll get some brain octane. All right. (laughs) Number two step is ocean water and chlorine dioxide. I've had children take ocean water. Parasites do not like ocean water, by the way. And they've been so infested in the gut that they've taken ocean water orally, and out the other end has come what looks like angel hair pasta because they had so many pinworms in the rectum, just, just on the inside, that all of a sudden all these pinworms came right out. 